Okay, juniors, good morning. Happy Monday. We're going to talk really quick here this morning, uh, the Korean War. So we're going to, this week, we're focusing on Korean War, Vietnam War, um, two wars that took place during the Cold War era in which the United States had the the emphasis and the focus on containing or stopping the spread of communism. Okay, so before we get into Korea, we have to talk about events in China that occur very shortly after World War II. So after World War II from... 1945 to 1949 there is a Chinese civil war that is fought um, where you had individuals in China um, that had developed communist thoughts individuals in China who were not that were you know democratic I guess you want to say and we call them the nationalists so following World War II there is this the civil war that is that is fought in China between the the communists and the Chinese nationalists the United States, is not going to provide any direct military support to the nationalists. However, we do supply um, money, materials, things like that. And the same thing can be said about the Chinese communists. They were provided supplies by the Soviet Union and such. Um, eventually what does happen is the communists are going to win this war. The Chinese nationalists are going to flee to the Asian island of Taiwan and China in 1949 becomes becomes communist. Uh, Mao Zedong, um, Chairman Mao, becomes the communist leader of China. Um, as far as the United States, again, this is very shortly after World War II, right, where we now already have some of this rivalry, I guess you could say, between communism and democracy and that sort of thing. But following this, the United States, we were really in shock, and obviously during this time communism was kind of the you know the very taboo word that gave everybody the heebie-jeebies in the united states but the people of the united states it was mostly like how did this happen you know how did another nation become communist and president truman is going to take a uh, pretty hard rap bad rap for not doing enough for not sending troops for not providing more aid and um and that was something where again you know truman made the call there not to do those things and that kind of directly leads into our Korean War that's going to start in 1950 and last into 1953. So if we're looking at our map here, here is the Korean Peninsula. It's highlighted here on the map. There you see North and South Korea. And it's the, the peninsula that hangs off the coast of, of China here. And so following China becoming communist, there was some um, influence there. And the other thing here is with World War II is... In the north, northern portion of the Korean Peninsula, the Soviet Union had gotten the Japanese forces there to surrender. Um, and in the southern portion of Korea, the United States had gotten the Japanese forces there to surrender. So now again, kind of that same U.S. and Soviet influence. So the Soviet Union is going to become very influential in the north. Again, communism, United States, freedom, democracy becomes very influential in the South. And following World War II, you know, it was kind of undecided what to do with Korea. So it is decided is to split Korea in half, essentially. And you see the, the border here between North and South Korea, right at the 38th parallel, right? The 38th line of, of latitude North for, for us to find geographers. And eventually what happens is unexpectedly in June of 1950, the Koreans in the North, the communists or the, more so communists are going to invade South Korea. And it was kind of like unexpected, you know, both they had been talking about with the United Nations, you know, how do we make Korea unified? What does that look like? Obviously the North Koreans and the Soviet Union wanted a unified Korea to look <coughs> communist. The United States and the South Koreans wanted it to be, you know, unified, but democratic. And so the talks in the UN kind of, you know, were very heated, obviously, especially when he had like the U.S. influence, the Soviet influence, etc. Um, and in June of 1950, um, really without any warning or anything like that, the North is going to invade the South, and the troops from the North were aided by the Soviet Union by their money and materials, not Soviet troops. And the United States is going to back the South by sending troops. Okay, and that was something I think that. Um, Truman had made that call based on the fact that some of the bad rap he had taken about what had happened in China previously. Um, so again, the United States, this is a, a conflict that we will become directly involved in with direct military support. Um, uh, about a half a million U S troops are going to serve in this, um, war. Now, the other thing about the Korean war too, is 
Congress never formally declared war, so it wasn't quote unquote a technical war like how we had declared war in, during World War II and that sort of thing. But the United States gets directly involved. Um, a lot of people thought that Truman had maybe overstepped his bounds by getting directly involved. However, his argument that was because there was U.S. troops stationed there, that any invasion was a, a matter of U.S. security and the United States here um, involved with the U.N. Army, the United Nations Army, that, you know, obviously this is happening. And um, the United States said they were backing a U.N. initiative. So that's kind of how this happened without a formal door, war declaration. Okay. Douglas MacArthur, who was the World War II hero, right? Um, he eventually is going to take command of the U.S. and U.N. forces. And the Northerners had a huge upper hand like this. You know, they'd kind of taken the, the South by surprise, like we had said. And because of that, um, and because of that, the North had an upper hand. So MacArthur is going to lead huge, huge counterattacks with heavy artillery and all those kinds of things. And they're actually going to push the Northerners nearly back into China. So if you're looking here at the map, right? We said the North had gotten into the South and it started pushing the Southern or the Southern forces and the UN forces, you know, closer to the South, um, Southern region of the Korean peninsula. When MacArthur takes command, he, you know, is going to lead some of these counterattacks. They're going to actually push these Northern forces back across the 38th parallel and right up by the Yalu river, which is kind of the boundary here between North Korea and China. And, when that happens, when the Northerners get pushed nearly into China, China, you know, did not like that the war was getting so close to them. China as a communist nation also did not like the fact that the communist side was now kind of losing. And so China is going to come to the aid of the Northerners and they're going to join the war by providing direct troops and that sort of thing. And eventually they're going to push the Korean, the South Korean UN, U.S. forces um, further south. Uh, during this process, they're actually going to capture the South Korean capital of Seoul. And again, it kind of just goes back and forth. And that's the way this war goes. Eventually, the UN and the South, they will liberate Seoul and they'll um, they'll push the North back into the North and, and that kind of thing. And while this is happening, MacArthur, he wants more. He wants the United States to break out the nuclear weapons. He calls for a, a blockade of the southern coast of China. And Douglas MacArthur wanted to take the war to China now at this point because of their actions. And the, the very complicated thing with that became is that many military advisors uh, and other leaders, world leaders, thought that that would lead to World War III. If we invade China, that would, that would bring the Soviet Union into it. And now we're going to have a full-fledged probably nuclear war at that point, especially if we're to reuse nuclear weapons on China. And, you know, him and Truman, uh, President Truman kind of had this very volatile relationship. And, you know, Truman had basically said, OK, we're not doing that. You know, MacArthur, your your ideas are, are too far, too far fetched. There's too big of you know potential consequences for doing things like this. Um, MacArthur goes to the media and starts kind of bad mouthing Truman. And then in April of, of 1951, I believe uh, Truman is going to fire Douglas MacArthur, the war hero. And again, MacArthur was a very famous person with, with the United States public. Um, and once he gets fired, you know, there was a lot of people initially that were so mad at Truman for doing that. And it was, it's interesting that when MacArthur returned home back to the United States, they actually had a big parade for him in New York city after he'd been fired. And, um, you know, the American public was pretty, pretty upset about this right away initially, um, in time, though, they kind of forget and, you know, later kind of decide that, hey, actually, it was probably the best idea that MacArthur was relieved of his duty. As far as how this war ends, so it's going to end in 1953 um, after there's about 60,000 American deaths and even more Korean deaths. But the war is going to end in a stalemate. Um, the Soviet Union kind of asked for that, actually, out of nowhere. Um, and what's going to happen is in 1953, the two sides are going to meet the North and the South. They're going to meet in um, a city along the along the, the 38th parallel and they're going to sign an armistice not a peace treaty right a peace treaty is different right um, but they're going to sign an armistice to agree to stop fighting and to this day a, a treaty has still never been signed there's been talks of it and you know north korea in the news recently with the potential death of kim jong-un right there's a lot a lot of things that can be said right now but um, the way this korean war ends is there is a creation of a demilitarized zone between the North and the South. 
um, along the 38th parallel, right? The boundary between North and South Korea, where they literally to this day will stand and stare at each other, um, you know, to make sure that one side isn't trying to, you know, invade again. And this also leads to uh, the United States having a very tense relationship with North Korea and with China, you know, and still right now with North Korea, maybe not as much with China, but, you know, at times, obviously with the trade wars and such, we have. Um, but the other big thing that comes out of this, and this is kind of what leads us into the Vietnam era, is the United States decides that essentially, you know, you know, that we were successful by not allowing communism to spread across the entire Korean peninsula and that this policy of containment is workable, that we can contain communism, you know, whether it's with military action or aid or however. And what this does lead to is the United States eventually stationing more and more troops in Asia. You know, in, in present day, the United States, we have a very high number of troops located in South Korea. Um, and this is something that kind of leads into Vietnam when the United States, again, will fight another war of communist containment in Southeastern Asia. As always, please let me know if you have questions. Have a good rest of your day.